Welcome to help the burn of every major navy. Every major treaty navy. And this is going to have some extra ships in it in contrast to the live. Because yes, I'm recording this before I do the live and this is going to have the Kriegsmarine added in. Well, you know, I might as well make sure that there is something extra in Long Patrol. And it seemed fair to add them into this because I'm going to probably be discussing the things and answering questions far more on the ships which I've mentioned already in the live. So, adding in a little bit of extra here seems fair. Now, I'm also going to be slightly naughty in that I'm going to open an extra can of Iron Brew today, and I am opening an extra can of Iron Brew today because, honestly, I am, as we speak when I record this, I have recorded three, six, nine, ten out of the thirty videos I need to record for June. Ten. I have written another 15, no, 12, but, so I, I have 12 more that I can record this week, and then I'll have 8 more to record over the next 2 weeks, and they're the 8 longest. He says, having recorded one video, which is already 2.5 hours long, which is the glorious 1st of June, Which will come out on the 3rd of June, because the live's on the 1st of June. There's also HMS Warspite in USS Texas in there, one of which is an hour and 20 minutes and the other one's an hour and 17 minutes. You know, these things happen. USS Enterprise and HMS Nubian haven't been recorded yet. But with all this going on, it has made doing this video, this video, this Patreon, rather an interesting question to get into because what does a burn constitute? Being a burn. Shameless book plug. Like, um, I do this in almost every time this this comes up as this slide because. It's worthwhile noting, but also because someone actually used to accuse me on almost every single video of glamorizing the life of being an academic, of making it seem easier and nicer than it actually was. And I thought, well, I don't think I am, but I will also never want to be the scenario where I'm being dishonest. It's fun. I love teaching. I love doing lecturing. Does it necessarily pay the bills? Well, I'm lucky. I work a uh, portfolio of careers thanks to my qualifications, including YouTube, and it's a good job I do because the university paychecks are probably the uh, least reliable of the lot. We live and hope that changes. But also there is the fact that if you get a tenured post, you do seem to get a lot, a lot of time spent doing these days, doing committees, etc. And you're also supposed to still be doing research and publica uh, publicizing those research in journal articles and books and, well, not they've not added videos yet to the list, but I wouldn't be surprised if they do at some point. And you get absolutely no life for anything else. And whilst I am a bit of a workaholic, and a functioning insomniac, I do enjoy spending time with my family. I, you know, for today, today I could have spent the whole day recording in order to take away, but I cooked lunch for the family instead. Why? Because it's a nice thing to do, especially if I'm going to be spending most of a month away in June, it seems a nice thing to do. But 
yeah. There seems to be a small problem going on, or as a, a good friend of mine likes to say, especially when they're talking about the books they're writing, there is something in the rotten in the state of Denmark. I do like putting that into a scenario of these books. And I do agree. It seems to me often, these days, that the idea is you work yourself... You, you uh, live to work rather than necessarily work to live. And whilst that's good for a certain set of people, I'm very happy to achieve that. Uh, do that. Some people do like to have a bit of a work-life balance. Or if you're very lucky like me, and mainly thanks to all of your support, it's able to make a job to an extent you're living, which is a lot of fun and something you enjoy and get actually get a genuine thrill out of doing. So, the burn. Okay, the thing I like about this image is because I know it's an art it's a sort of it's a artistic computer aided rendition, but it does really illustrate one of the major problems with their whole lift structure. Because if your lift does that when it gets to the top. You've got a problem. Just going to say it, you've got a problem. Because suddenly taking off and landing becomes a very interesting issue. While the lifts are in use. You can turn around and go, well, Alex, when the lifts are in use anyway, there's a problem with taking off and landing. Yes and no. Because if you consider the lift going up, on most ships, and the burn has three of them. So, they come at all different points. If any one of those lifts are raised up, you have a problem with takeoff and landing because of the air effect it's going to have, and because of, nice and away, the fact that they are a steel obstacle, and whereas a net and other things you can put up will mitigate a crash to hopefully make it at least survivable by the pilot in the air and the rest of the air crew, if not the aircraft. Steel structures tend to not do that. They really don't. But still, she worked. And this is basically the problem of this entire scenario, because... When we consider the burn and her conversion from a Normandy class battleship, just, 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 just no, no. Well, I, I, it's, it's just, it's just no. I have no idea what happened to the French when designing the Normandy class battleships, but they're just not good. So it was conversion of a battleship which was already bad into a carrier. But, and when I say a battleship which was already bad, well, it, they were either going to have. Well, Byrne was originally planned to have a full steam turbine set, and her hull was designed around that. And that probably would have made her a slightly better carrier. But some bright spark decided, oh, but if we do that, we're letting down French industry. So let's convert her back to a steam tur a single steam turbine set and two triple expansion engines. After we've already built the hull, and already dis and laid it out, and all the strength. Oh. Okay, okay. You see, there are two carriers which can cause me trouble. One of them does not qualify to be the burn, although it was the only carrier which is probably 
go, it's someone trying to design a more burnier burn than the burn, but it never came into service, so it doesn't count for this, because it was never actually used. And that is the Graf Zeppelin. But even the Graf Zeppelin, even the Graf Zeppelin, did not muck around with their engines that much. I, I, I do not know how much money in bribes was paid to justify that. In fact, there's something worse, okay? I have this sort of instinct that that wasn't due to bribery. This sort of feeling, this sort of feeling in the pit of my stomach tells me that that was not down to bribery. No, no, no. That was the good idea, fairy. Someone had a good idea. They thought it was a good idea. Not sure which bright spark it was. They've never claimed ownership of the good idea, as far as I can tell from all the, ver the French language sources I have managed to read and the English language sources I ha that I have. If anyone does particularly know who this good idea fairy is, I want to someday try and find, because I'm presuming they're buried somewhere, I want to find their gravestone and see if they mention anything to do with the burn on it. If they do, I will know once and for all whether it was the good idea fairy or it was a backhander. Anyway. So, that leads us to the definition of a burn. Mm -hmm. Definition of burn must be designed with the best intentions in mind. This is my purely nice thing coming. They must be trying to design the ship to be as good as they can make it. But the very design created must mitigate against their function in their role. So the lifts, the speed, the hangar design, every single component, rivet, weld, and piece of structure on that entire ship mitigated against her being a decent aircraft carrier. But she still functioned as an aircraft carrier, which is another point. So we'll define things as almost burns before christening navies burn, and this means we are not necessarily talking about their worst design. So I had an interesting thing, because I put together my list of what I thought would be the most burny of burn ships. And I then thought, well, hang on, Alex, just check this out, because you and Thrax spend a lot of time talking to each other recently. How close is your list to his list of the worst interwar ships? It's got some overlap, but not entirely. Not entirely. For starters, for me, there is nothing burnier than burn in the French Navy. And he was going for the worst absolute design they produced. And technically, the Ducassine class... They were designed as a sort of scout cruiser. They're kind of like other cruisers, which are designed as a very... Yes, they have no armor, but they can't be burnier than the burn. They're just not. Because... The thing is, I'd honestly question whether those were designed... The, the thing is, you're automatically designing those with the idea of 10,000 tons as your limit. Whereas, if you think about it, if you, you're compromising based on that. The French were designing the burn. There's no compromise intended. There just isn't. And when I say there isn't, I mean it's, it's 22,500 tons in standard. The limitation for a conversion, you, they could have made it up to 33,000 tons and pointed to Lexington Saratoga on, yeah, you can't tell us off. So, that's the thing, it's not brushing up against a treaty limit. It's nowhere near a treaty limit. Whereas the Ducassines are.
that's my partial defense of that decision making. But again, it means we're not necessarily talking about the worst. And I have to admit, I did consider getting into some modern ship designs, i.e. post-World War II ones. Mm, but that becomes an issue because the major powers change. And I did consider doing some pre-World War I designs. And I have got some in there. But... Again, I have to be kind of careful because, again, the major powers change. <sighs> Limitations. Always causes a compromise. So, let's start off with the Doopy Delone. French, almost number one, because, of course, you can't get Bernier to unburn. Well, this one comes jolly close, and unfortunately it sets the mould for future French cruisers. Yes, this is the armoured cruiser as envisioned by the Junocol. If you wish to throw up, I can understand, but don't worry, it's at least it's not the Blackburn Blackburn to look at. <sighs> Let's be honest, the French Navy, when designing this... And we're going to be charitable. We're trying to cram all the technology they could into it. The fact they made a vessel which was singularly unsuitable for its cruiser role. Because of its fussy design structure. Because that mitigates against doing the peacetime missions of a cruiser in terms of presence and... Uh, how do I put this? Entertaining and diplomacy. And because of its various other structural issues. Yep! Doopy to loam. Almost a burn. Not quite the burn, because you can't be burning it on the burn in the French Navy. But it comes close. It really comes close. And then we have the Mogador class Contra Torpelias, and frankly, I was tempted to put any of the Contra Torpelias in here. Why? Here is a small problem, and this will also turn up when I'm talking about the Rage of uh, the uh, Rage of Marina. Oh. So, ships have to be a balance of speed, firepower, and survivability. A.K. armor, but also structural design, etc. So usually I phrase it as survivability. For them to accomplish their missions in wartime and peacetime. They have to be able to balance on that. And for each class type of vessel, there is a slight difference in, a difference in terms of the weighting of that. And how you balance your ship. If you balance everything towards speed, that is great. But then you have to design and fit yourself with weapons which suit that speed. I, I don't know. Have enough power generation that you can actually power all the systems you've got. Just an idea. Just a small idea. Um, maybe if you are going to be using a vessel which can sh shoot along at nearly 40 knots, you want to make sure your guns can target at going when you're going at 40 knots. And you also probably, and I'm just going to say this, want to check out your torpedoes, okay? You want to make sure your torpedoes are suitably able to be dispatched with the necessary uh, accuracy that you can do that quickly whilst at speed. They could sustain the speed of... 34 knots in the sea state of 4, but, um, yeah, and we're an improvement over their predecessors in the Contra Torpelias, and frankly, I could have picked any class, but the thing is, once you get to the last of a class, and at no point have you gone, we're developing these very, very fast, very, very fast ships, okay? Mm hmm So, we need torpedoes that suit their speed. Okay. Their torpedoes, the 550mm 
Model 1923 DT Torpedo with a 308 kilogram warhead weighing in at 2 tons using a radial brotherhood alcohol engine to power it at 2 set speeds. The fast speed 39 knots to a range of 9,000 meters or 9 kilometers. And the slow speed 35 knots to a range of 13,000 meters or 13 kilometers. What in the name of all things? Frumpty Dumpty. What are you thinking? Because here is the problem, okay? I'm designing a ship which is as fast as the torpedoes it is firing. Now, cute, but what's the problem of that? Well, it means if it fires them at maximum speed and it's doing an incidental attack, then it can only turn in one direction. Think about that. Because if you fire, if you're doing an, a tangential attack and you're going along this angle, you s move to turn fire. You either have to do a full circle to fire your other torpedoes. You have to hope they get off in the same run. Or, and this is just a, a, a small, small issue. Just a, a very, very small issue. But it's worthwhile thinking about. It's, a, it's, a, it's an issue there. You can't fire your other side. You either have to go fully round. Or you dive off and you don't fire them. Because otherwise you're going to run into the torpedoes you just fired. Because you can either be going faster than them. If you're trying to range them for a long range shot. In which case they might collide with you as you turn across them. Or you could literally bash into them if they're going at the same speed as you. Now, they of course had two double and two triple torpedo tube launcher systems. Which is excellent. It gives them a bro uh, gives them five aside. But if you're gonna put that much money, that much time into developing your large destroyers. To the point at which you're launching something which is 3,000 tons in standard. So is the size of a cruiser from World War One, <clears throat> Which is a lovely looking ship. You'd expect A, you to have the power systems necessary to operate their guns at power, uh, uh, under power at full capability. So they can actually hit targets when you're going at full speed. And B... You'd expect you to develop something for the torpedoes. Because making torpedoes faster than 40 knots is not impossible. Even at this time. What other options are there? Well, there's the various versions of hydrogen peroxide engines going around, which are used for torpedoes. That tends to develop... Torpedoes with a significantly higher speed. For example, the Type 95 torpedo of the uh, Imperial Japanese Navy was capable of going at, well, 45 to 47 knots for 12 kilometers, or 49 to 51 kilometers, uh, 49 to 51 knots for 9 kilometers. Mm hmm. And then, of course, we've got the various American torpedoes, which are also similarly faster. So, the technology is around to build something which could have made it work. And here is the bonus, because I couldn't get through this and not have mentioned the Normandy class without pointing out that French dreadnoughts 
construction needed to pause. I, I'm not sure what happened. I think vaguely between the treaty coming in and the Dunkirks being designed, I like to imagine the entire design team was taken out somewhere to the Alps and they were given skis and they were told to have a nice life with all the fondue they could find but never come back to France. That is my belief. Uh, they were th that, That's what happened to the French naval architects who designed their dreadnoughts prior, during, to and prior to World War I. They go off to the Alps and they have a nice life of fondue and skiing with walking and vigorous mountain air during the summer months. You know, just a lovely time in Switzerland. Far away from any French naval design bureaus. And while they're away, and maybe it happens in the 1920s after the Burns built, maybe that's when it happens, I'm not sure. But then comes in a new generation and they design the Dunkirks. And finally you have a French dreadnought, a French battleship, where the structure and design make sense. Where the form does fit the function. And yes, Normandy class just. What happened to France? Who hurt them? Uh, this is another thing. I, I'm a historian. I have, I, I, I study naval history. At a certain point, it seriously seems like the French Navy goes through. what could best be described as a traumatic design period where just every design is just full of angsty emotion you know it's the, it's the sort of design which when you see it as a a piece of art on a wall you just feel immediately that the artist was going through a dr great trauma at the time they were putting this painting together, they were doing this art. And just sort of sitting there going, you really poured your emotions out onto canvas. And you want to laud it because it, on there it's, it's a beautiful example of being open and expressing and showing emotions and encouraging emotions. When it comes to ship design, though, it's it's not really um, the modus operandi we would prefer. Not really. So that brings us to the Rager Marina's almost number one, the Turbine class. Now, why is this here? Because, well, the Rager Marina will tell you they build destroyers. Thank you. <laughs> they keep saying they're building destroyers. Now, there is a small problem for me with the Rage and Marina's destroyers. They're a thousand tons in standard. Seventeen hundred tons fully loaded. Okay, fine. So, they take a lot of fuel on. A lot of fuel. And they can do 33 knots. But... The trouble is about being a destroyer, especially in the 1920s, 30s, and moving in World War II, is you and the, the Italians actually admit that some of their destroyers are not destroyers by reclassifying them as torpedo boats when they get to World War before just before World War II. There is the building a destroyer. A destroyer is a general purpose made of all work. Now, prior to World War One, yes, a torpedo boat is largely what it is. But, uh... When you are designing a ship, and it is a thousand tons, and it is four 4.7 inch guns in two twin gun turrets, Four and aft. Um, they have a pair of forty millimeter AA guns. Um, 
some 13.2mm AA guns and carry six 21 inch torpedoes or 52 mines. Okay, you have built something which is more powerful than the torpedo boat, i.e. the motor launch torpedo boat that you will see operating in the English Channel or fighting a Schnell boat. You are building something which is a torpedo boat according to German practice and there's a few other nations which do build them. You're not building a destroyer. And this is my problem with the turbine class. If I compare them to the German torpedo boats, I like them. If I compare them to destroyers, they don't have enough firepower. They can't do the job because this is not something that wants to go and fight another destroyer. There is a reason why some Italian destroyer classes are pretty much cannon fodder when it comes to fighting Royal Navy destroyers. And it's not because they're not, they don't have crews who aren't brave or full of a land. It's because you basically have to depend on a torpedo to kill your opponent because you definitely haven't got the gunfire to do it. These ships are so focused on speed, 33 knots, and torpedoes. They've, they're nothing else. And that's a problem when you're a destroyer. It's a problem when you are supposed to be doing everything else. And this is one of the troubles with Hotter Rager and Marina in World War II. Uh, one of the questions I often get asked about them is that they do, are this fully, on paper, fully capable Navy. They have far more capital ships than the Kriegsmarine ever has. In fact, the Kriegsmarine dreams to have as many capital ships available as the Rager and Marina has. They certainly have far better heavy cruisers, despite the fact that the Zara class is here, but that's another reason for the Zara class to be here. But the reason they are as limited as they are in what they do is because their destroyers limit them. These are offensive vessels. That's a, the interesting thing. When you're dealing with a smaller destroyer, 1,000 ton standard displacement with all these torpedoes, they're offensive units. This vessel is not made to escort a force. This vessel is not designed to defend something or go at so speed. No, it's high speed, dash in, attack, get out of there. Its guns are purely there as extra things to assist it in getting into firing position. But its whole purpose is to get in, launch its torpedoes and get out. It's fine for that mission. But it's not a destroyer. Because a destroyer has always been a torpedo boat destroyer. This thing is not designed to go and fight other destroyers. It's not. Now, well, the Zara class. So, what is my problem with Zaras? They are lovely. They are massively overweight, nearly 2,000 tons. But what is my problem with them? Well, these were supposed to be the better than the Trentos. That's their point. They're supposed to be better than them. They are designed to be the armoured, more balanced version of the Trentos. They have a main belt, which is, well, 5.9 inches. Originally, they'd wanted 8 inches, well, really, of uh, belt armour, but, you know, they had to settle for nearly uh, just below 6. <laughs> they wanted a speed of 32 knots. They got the speed of 32 knots. And the point really is this. They removed torpedo tubes. They get rid of the flush deck of the Trentos, incorporating a step down. They 
gave them just two shafts instead of the previous Trentos, which had had, well, four shafts. They're trying to design a more survivable vessel, and yet at the same time, they are actually making it less survivable. Three of them, three of the class, are lost at Matapan. And these were the survivable heavy cruisers. These were the ones which they broke treaty limits to make them more survivable, and yet they still failed. Or rather, they balked, they balked at sort of the amount they're breaking the treaty, and so they didn't make them survivable. I don't mind, in fact, on, on the naval treaties, I expect nations to cheat. I find it galling when they cheat, not only badly, but they actually pull their cheating for no gain. To save weight say displacement, they had ordered the designers to eliminate unnecessary features. The unnecessary features for this cruiser? Apparently two inches of belt armor, torpedo tubes, and a whole lot of other subdivision and structure internally which have made them far, far more survivable. Would they survive Matapan? No. Nicest way, if you let Warspite, Formidable, Valiant, and Barum get that close to you. Life is not going to be good. But the interesting thing is, would there have been that scenario if Polar hadn't been damaged? Polar is immobilized by a torpedo from a swordfish bomber. If she'd had four shafts, would she have been immobilized? Because that's something else which is deleted to save weight. They go from a four shaft system down to two shafts. But still, they're not the burn. The burn of the Italian Navy, the design for but mitigating against, is got to be the Condottoris. In fact, I'm going further. I'm going to say the Gassiano class. I was tempted. The trouble is, as the Condottoris go on, they actually get slightly better. They actually do get slightly better. And I've done a whole videos about Italian cruiser classes last year during the year of the cruiser. And so you can find my views on them quite regularly. But the, uh, the, the Condottori. Another product of 1930s launching. A product of the 1930s design craze and the, well, the beginning of the 1930s design craze, really. The late 1920s. And this was a continuation of the Franco-Italian naval race. They were going for speed, and that was all that mattered. And you end up with so many good ideas. Let's, for starters, consider putting aircraft at the front of your ship to launch and recover them. It's theoretically a great idea if you because you steam into wind, you can give them the maximum wind support. It's great. Apart from small issues. One, craning them into that position when you're doing when you're doing it means that your guns are covered, and that means you are not only stationary to pick up aircraft, but you have issues with that. Yeah, that, that's nothing. We'll leave that to one side. Um 
There's also the fact that that means you have to have a aviation fuel plus an open space at the front of your ship which is going to affect your buoyancy and your likely flammability if you're hit, and let's be honest, it's not as if they have armor. It's not as if they have armor because, let's see, they had 20mm on the decks, which is splinter at best. A belt of 24mm, well, that's going to see that the, uh, it's going to see that the detonators work, isn't it? Turrets, 23mm, and tower of 40mm armor. Uh, it's just... no. This ship is designed with speed being the critical thing. And there's nothing too wrong with that until you find yourself in a scenario where speed doesn't help. And that's really the problem. And really the issue for them in terms of their construction. I was considering this because I was going through and thinking, well, is this really the burn or is this just a bad design? And you see, the reason, the definition of a burn for me is something which is designed with the best intention of mine, in mind, but the actual design you make and the emphasis you put in that design and the decisions you make in design actually make it not as able to do its job as it should have been. And that's a classic thing here. Because these ships, realistically, are going to be the backbone of any Italian operation. They should be. They're going to be its reconnaissance force, because the Italians have decided that with the French going for very big, very fast destroyers, they will respond by having titchy destroyers, who are hopelessly offensive, and they will have cruisers, which will be destroyer killers. The trouble is, if we consider the La Fantastique class and their firepower, well, um, five, five and a half inch guns. Okay. A five and a half inch gun. Maximum firing range, roughly 20 kilometers. Gissiana class of cruiser, of course, they have their 6-inch guns. Uh, they're wonderful. Models 1929, mostly, but some of them did have the model 1926, but mostly they had the model 1929. And by wartime, I think all of them had the 1929 variant. Maximum firing range. By World War Two, twenty two point six kilometers. You'd better hope you hit your La Fantastique quickly if you're engaging it because it's running in at you at thirty seven knots. You could be running in at it at thirty seven knots as well. Closing speed of 74 knots, that distance of 2.4, 2.6 kilometers is going to go very, very quickly. If we put another way, you've got a closing speed of roughly 138 kilometers an hour if you're both going at maximum speed which by my rough maths in my head please note in my head is two point two point three kilometers a minute closing speed so you've got about a minute before you're in firing range of each other. And that's if you manage to fire and engage each other at maximum range. If you don't, you're already well with inside range. And they're fi they you are the bigger target. And they have five five point five inch guns, you have eight six inch guns, but there are more of them than you. 
and which costs more to replace? A big destroyer or a high speed small cruiser? Yeah, I don't see this hunting down many Le Fantastiques. And they really didn't. In World War II, they had uh, issues with things called tribal class destroyers on a semi regular basis, and they were just mean. And then we go with the Fubuki class. Now, these are often held up as being some of the first modern destroyers. They are lauded for their double mounts, for their high torpedo armament, for everything. However, why do they fit the burn category? Because they're high, very high top weight parameters meant that they were about as stable as I'm trying to think of something about stables, but in in terms of firing your weapons from them, you really didn't want to be. Stability in anything approaching moderate to heavy seas was something for other people to experience. And again, this is a function, this is a product of the design. The way they've been designed is to make them the best destroyers they can be. And they really could be on paper. But, honestly, to make it work, they probably need another 200 to 300 tons. Because, yes, they have nine torpedo tubes, and they can launch nine 24-inch torpedoes. Which is friggin' scary. Yes, they have six five-inch guns. And that is also very capable. So don't get me wrong. In firepower terms, sitting there, you should be talking about a really, really good destroyer. But they probably needed to have And I'm, I'm saying this in the nicest way. They probably needed to have... About... An extra meter in terms of beam. I'm not talking about a lot. They are 10.4 meters. I would say roughly they need for their amount of top weight. They need to be roughly in the 11.4, 11.5 meter uh, beam range. And in terms of length, well, their overall is 118.41 meters, which is again not bad. But you probably need to increase that to about to maintain the the length to beam ratio for their speed and their handling, you would probably need to increase that up to about oh, I would say 118 no, it's 118 overall you said, I'm sorry, mass went wrong about 126 Now, you can sit there, you're probably sitting there going, but Alex, you know, they're destroyers. You're, you're making them bigger. Well, they're designed underneath the Washington Treaty. Remember, which only limits all vessels less than capital ships or carriers to less than 10,000 tons. It doesn't say that there's an upper limit on destroyers. That's the London Treaty which comes in and makes those changes. And then that's what leads to the class after the Fubuki class, which are frankly worse than a burn. In that, well, ra rather than being a burn level of design with good intentions, and then you still muck it up, they are designed with, I can only say, as the most absurd intentions known to mankind, and you get, you get a, cl a class of vessels which are designed to kill their own sailors. So that's why the Fubukis are in the burns. Not the other class after them. Because these were designed with the best intentions, with theoretically no limits and no treaty limits to impact on them and uh, re required, uh, you know, confine their design, and yet still, still, 
They don't. I will say one thing, though. If they had been built to that size, they would probably have been far closer to the 2,000 tons they are they displaced when they've been rebuilt. And I wouldn't be surprised... Ultimately, if they turned out to be some of the most lethal destroyers ever built. And actually, you could go to full hog and make them even slightly bigger and stick in a fourth turret. And then they would have tribal level firepower in terms of gunnery and <whistles> level firepower in terms of torpedoes. And maybe at that point, they would have probably led to a wholly interesting different category in the Washington Naval Treaty, which been destroyer leaders, not of less than, you know, 1,850 tons, but uh, the destroyer leaders category would be of vessels, probably, they would, it would be classified, they would be allowed to build destroyer leaders of up to 2,250 tons. So we can imagine what her tribal class destroyer or what the various other destroyers designed by the US Navy etc. would be like with an extra 400 tons of leeway to go through. That could be fun. Next one in the almost, I Jane, almost the Megamis. Okay. So here is the thing. The Megamis are designed with 6-inch guns, and to be able to upgrade to have 8-inch guns, and that's actually what the Japanese do with them. But these are their... I can only describe them as their reconnaissance, light cruisers, which they decide to make into heavy cruisers. By replacing their 5 triple 6-inch guns with 5 twin 8 inch guns. Now, here is the thing. I'm not actually that anti the design overall, and there are some there are some good points here. But why does this make the list of a burn? Well, Quite simple. You are designing it to be able to be upgraded quite easily from 6 inch to 8 inch guns. Which means you are designing it to be enhanced and to go and do that kind of 8 inch, what you would expect of a heavy cruiser in terms sort of modus of operations. Now, if you're going to design it to be able to upgrade its guns, wouldn't it be sensible to also function in design capability to upgrade its armor? If you are going to break the treaty, if you are going to, as a function of your design, actually break the treaty and design something to be able to be upgraded, and you're designing this as 8,500 tons theoretically standard load, uh, the actual standard displacement was 11,000 tons, so you're already breaking the treaty, and I would agree there were various commentators of informed types who uh, had various remarks about Japanese construction of basic long lines of, if that is 8,500 tons, then <clears throat> insert random uh, random quote of point of, of order here afterwards. Well, if you're, if you're designing it, then you have to design it to be able to upgrade it fully to the 8-inch capability. Not what they've done is they've designed it so it can be upgraded, sticking the 8-inch guns. Yay, we've got 8-inch guns. We've still got a horrible funnel stack, a funnel stack design. We still have an absolutely atrocious armor, uh, you know, layout in terms of where our aviation fuel is stored and uh, we've still got those same terrible air defense systems but leaving that all to one side why have we not designed a ship that if we're going to design a ship that can be upgraded we design it all that can be upgraded 
It just seems wrong. It still works, though, and that's another criteria to burn. They're not necessarily the most terrible things. They are the burniest. So what is the burniest of the IJN? Well, this is going to be no surprise to some of you who've ever heard me talking about her. The Ryujo! I'm sorry, Japan. I'm not sorry, Japan! Just wear it, okay? You tried to design a vessel of less than 10,000 tons to be an aircraft carrier. And the thing is, you could have got away with it, and you could have actually started something off sensible if you had actually exercised a modicum of sense while doing so. Now, admittedly, it still came in at 10,600 tons in standard, but frankly... Theoretically, officially in 1936... Officially, in as built, it was 8,000 tons in standard. Officially, as built. And yes, you did get the treaties changed around. But, and I say this with the most overwhelmingly from a kind place, from a loving place. If you had sat back and gone, let's accept slightly less aircraft. Let's make this a slightly more conventional design. Let's make this slightly le let's try and make this just a tad more sensible. Maybe go, you know what? 28 knots is fine. 29 knots is lovely, but 28 knots is fine. All sorts of things could have been sorted out. But instead, instead, you design a ship which has no armor. Fine, it's an aircraft carrier, it's not supposed to be in the firing line, I can accept the no armor. You take a single uh, an air, a ship which is designed for a single hangar, and you double the aircraft stowage to make it a double carrier, double height. You see, this is one of the things. As they, she was designed, she was going to have a single hangar and 24 aircraft. Now, here is some interesting things. If you left her as that... Even the later on trouble with the lift, etc., could have been mitigated. And also, probably, with our only being able to take 24 aircraft, the obvious scenario would be someone would, instead of making 10,000 ton carriers or below 10,000 ton carriers Ill illegal, British and Americans would probably add it in a, a category because, okay, it's carrying only 24 aircraft. But for the British, that would have been great. Because they could design a lot of carriers around 24 aircraft that could maybe fulfill one of their categories, i.e. probably the... probably that would fulfill the cruiser carrier sort of convoy escort vessel, but also could fulfill some of the functions of the fleet carrier which is why they end up with the armoured box and illustrious glass doing that role. And they could have then concentrated more of their ton their carrier tonnage around the strike carrier role, so slightly less armour, but slightly more aircraft, and have built more sort of variations along the Ark Royal type. So the British could have got behind that quite happily. As could the Americans, because let's be honest, there is going to be an American carrier in this list. Unsurprisingly. But the reality is, this vessel is an absolutely terrible example of its type. Yes, it works, as does the burn. Hence, it's the burn. But as a carrier, there are constant issues with its top weight. Even after it's been 
fixed after the great typhoon in the Four Fleet incident in 1935, where the ship's bridge, flight deck, superstructure were damaged and the hangar was flooded. Let's all please note how bad it has to be for the hangar to flood on a carrier. They raised her forecastle, one deck. The bow was remodelled with a flare to improve sea handling. All sorts of things were done to try and fix her. But... And by the way, that thing at the front is where you find the navigation and control bridge. But at no point did anyone just say, why are we doing this? And that's the real problem again. It's kind of like with the burn, when they were making those en choice of those engines and they were going, yeah, let's change the ship from two turbines, uh, two turbine sets to a... Uh, two triple expansion engines and a turbine set. Why? Why are we doing this? No one asked a question with Vern of why are we taking this light carrier we're designing to try and get in underneath the treaty limitations under 10,000 tons and cramming on an extra hangar? Why? 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 Yes, more aircraft is good, but not necessarily the most sensible thing to do if you want to actually get this through. <sighs> the Pensacola class. Okay, so. Let's all start thinking of this wonderful idea. Because here is the wonderful idea to house a Pensacola class. They want to make cruisers which are as fast as possible because they're going to be the scouting force. And they are built before there's heavy cruiser, light cruiser defined. So please don't get into that. Yeah, all cruisers are going to have 8-inch guns. And some are going to have armor and do the fighting cruiser role. And some are going to be speed demons and do the light cruiser role. But you'll notice there's a small issue going on with this design. And if you are really smart, you will figure out exactly what the problem is going to be. See, to maximise the length to beam ratio, they want to make the ship as narrow as possible at the front. So, they stick the twin turrets on the lower level and the triple turrets on the higher level because they have to have 10 8-inch guns because they can't just be faster. They have to have more firepower than their British and Japanese counterparts. They have to have 10 8-inch guns because, you know, woody Americans, we have to have more firepower. Let's think about this. Let's really think about this with the Pensacola class. What's that going to do? Well... It's going to add to the top weight issue, isn't it? Because your heavier turrets are the ones higher up. Oh, and then you have a more narrow hull. You have as narrow as it possibly can be. So you have a narrow hull, and you have more top weight. You're going to roll a lot. That's going to make you doing your job of moving fast in heavy seas, etc., to do reconnaissance... More difficult. But as bad as it was, and there's the fact that, you know, this was a really, really bad idea, both members of the class actually survived World War II, both proved useful in World War II. And there is the fact that her armor belt was at least 64 millimeters. So whilst this is unable to 
protect her from 8-inch fire and probably not going to protect her from 6-inch fire, it is at least going to mean that between the 64 and occasionally 102 millimeters of thickness of armor belt she carries, she is probably going to be able to fight off destroyers. Which means she's not quite as bad as some of the cruisers we've talked about already. So, what's next? <laughs> the Ranger. I'm not sure I need to make the case for why this is a the burn scenario, but I'm going to. The Ranger is possibly the single most inelegant, inefficient, and useless American carrier design produced. Okay, it's not useless entirely because it is actually of use and is used, but let's be honest, the US Navy spent most of World War II panicking, well, most of the first couple of years, panicking over having enough carriers in the Pacific, and at any moment anyone suggested the Ranger, they basically looked at you as if you were absurd. It was too slow. And specifically leaving it in the Metro in the Atlantic for the Kriegsmarine, well, they were a weaker opponent. That was literally what was decided. It's always good to know that someone was actually practical about it. But please note, they didn't like her going in the Mediterranean. So, that shows you the order of priority of opponents. Kriegsmarine. Rage Marina. Imperial Japanese Navy. Now, as you can see, her entire upper deck is devoted to her hangar. And the flight deck was a light superstructure sheathed in wood. Wood was found to be very easily repairable, which is useful. And with free elevators, they provided uh, more than enough adequate abilities to move aircraft between the deck and the, ha uh, the hangar and the flight deck. Theoretically, she operated 76 aircraft, which was equal to Lexington, but with half the displacement. This sounds like a wonderful thing. A wonderful capability. And at 14,800 tons standard, she certainly is that. Even her top speed is 29.3 knots, officially. She's one of the few naval ships, though, which was the whole way through faced with cuts. She's designed and commissioned without torpedo storage or a torpedo bomber squadron. Because, you know, it's not as if making holes in ships to let water in is an important thing for a warship. <sighs> Unfortunately, her flight deck, well, there's a small problem with that. You see, you make it so light that she can be such a light ship and you can produce it. That's a wonderful idea until aircraft get heavier. And it's not as if, if you look back at aircraft development that's happened in the previous 10 years, there has been a steady increase in the weight of aircraft, and it's not as if there are people wandering around who are called, I don't know, United States Naval Aviators, who are telling you that their aircraft keep getting heavier because you want to do more with them. No, 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 we will design a flight deck which will be just strong enough to take the aircraft that are landing and recovering now. That's why in 1943, Ernie King approved an extensive modernization. This is to replace her flight deck supports. This is to replace her elevators. The aft elevator and the midship elevator was, you know, replaced with a deck edge, a deck edge elevator. Flight deck catapults were to be installed. 
they were to deal with weight and protection issues by putting blisters on the hull. Armament was increased to be with additional 40mm quadruple mounts. There is a small problem. By this point, the US Navy is under full swing building all the Essexes and the other cruisers they are producing, and other carriers they're producing. And frankly, they don't want to spare the manpower. In fact, the Bureau of Ships pretty much stands up to Admiral King on this one and says, there is no point wasting this money converting this ship. In fact, as it was in May 1944, when she entered Norfolk Navy Dockyard, she had her flight deck strengthened, new aircraft catapults installed, and new radar equipment updated, and then she's basically turned into a night fighter interceptor training carrier. Which is a nice use of her. It's a nice use of her. And it's good. The US Navy does need something to train them in night fighting and night carrier capabilities to grow that. Which is why she isn't the USN's burn. No, that goes to Sim class. It's always fun when both me and Drac agree on something. But, you see, the thing is... The point I'd make is... At what point was anyone sensibly paying attention? Okay, the Japanese we know are a bit absurd about their top weight issues. We know the Japanese are basically cheating and trying to gain the system. They are the whole way through. It's accepted part of the naval treaties. US Navy, with the Sims class. One has to wonder what happened. The design is for something which is supposed to be 5, 5 inch 38. Okay, they're not bad. They're very good guns. 12 21 inch torpedoes in three quadruple mounts, one mount center line, two wa uh, two wasted. Depth charge racks. This is a good general purpose destroyer. By 1941, they have four 5-inch guns. Always nice. They have eight torpedo tubes in uh, two quadruple sets, both centre-lined, and some depth charge racks. They still have 50 cal uh, machine guns as their main protection. By 1944, they have four 5-inch guns. They've lost. In they've kept maintained their four inch, uh, their four five inch guns, but you know they've of course lost one earlier on. Four forty millimeter guns. Four twenty millimeter guns. Eight torpedo tubes. Sometimes they even carry torpedoes in them when they're feeling very brave. Six K gun depth charge throwers and two depth rack, uh, charge racks. And their fuel capacity. Well, <laughs> that's a constant fun. So what is the problem? What is the problem? Well, for other ships, I'm prepared to make an excuse of treaty limitations. But the US Navy, the one thing I do like about them, especially when you look at their all the wider construction going on, Mount Japan stops. Mount Japan stops taking notice of the treaties. The USN starts thinking about not taking notice of the treaties. They want to design something better than they've dealt with before. That's the thing. The US Navy is trying to design something which is a better ship than they've had before and a lighter ship than they've had before. 
and you can't do that. They are trying to make too many changes in one hull. Too many leaps in one hull. And they could have mainly done, maybe done it over a class, as the Japanese did with the Fubukis. But the USN is trying to jump straight ahead whilst also build just one uh, build just one hull. And ends up with a ship which is a destroyer. It works. Sort of. But it's nowhere near the capability it was. And just to pr suggest that sort of burn cap style capabilities are not necessarily uh, that unusual in history. The Texas and the Maine. Interesting ships. But in many ways their design and the shaping of their design mitigates their being actually useful as a cruiser or as a battleship. Even in their own periods. But, they're not burned because, well, frankly, they do form the basis in the future funding coming of the US Navy. It's nice of them to have them, but mainly their reaction to the Brazilians getting a decent ship. Oh. <sighs> the Dido class. I'm not sure how I phrase this, but for me, they will always be one of the worst cruiser designs the Royal Navy ever comes up with. And people say, no, but, but they're very good, they're AA cruisers, they, do, they provide such good AA fire. Yeah, they do. But, they are also hopelessly top-heavy, which is why Dido here is missing a turret. There's also the production issues of the turrets, but, you know, there is uh, missing this turret does make them far more easy to balance and manoeuvre along. They needed to be given, a, again, a broader hull. They needed to probably have a slightly long, uh, broader, longer hull, but they're trying to use the Arafusa hull. And honestly, they should have gone with the Leander hull. But, you know, they're trying to use the Arafusa because the Arafusa are great. And this is something. They are definitely not a burn because they are very capable little ships and they do exactly what they're supposed to do. These ships managed to get in their own way in terms of their job. Their AA cruiser capabilities, their AA capabilities mitigates against their cruiser capabilities. Their very busy, very fussy design, which is overflowing with stuff, makes it even more complicated. But they're not the Royal Navy's burn. Now, also actually an interesting part of me at some point trying to go, well, what na do some navies not have a burn? And very quickly, I, I've worked out that wasn't the case, sadly enough. And this was so close to being the burn. <laughs> so close. The K-Class submarine. Ah, oh, lovely. The K-Class submarine. It's a cruising submarine. It's great to have one. If it works. But this, of course, is steam-powered. There was literally no good reason for this. And why do I say no good reason? Because these engines are available, being built in enough quantity. The entire idea, it's... it's it's basically, someone's got to assess the idea of, we want to do a cruising submarine. 
what the what all the ships we use cruising and do do uh, have cruising have they all have steam engines oil fired steam engines thank god they didn't go for coal but you know they go for this and just think about the sheer size of that vessel but also the sheer weight the sheer scale the sheer problems all that impl implanting of that engine system created. So before we get over the fact that this means you have not one stack, but two stacks going down inside your hull. It's just not a sensible design. It's just not. And the fact they lasted as long as they did in British service worries me. Because the last went out of service in 1931. What also worries me is this class was supported by Keys, Jellico, and Beatty. Thankfully, Fisher did oppose, and Fisher, in 1913, uh, on the class's suggestion, had responded the most fatal error imaginable we'd put steam engines in submarines. Ay, caramba. It's a very different world, the submarines of this period, than the submarines of today. They are submersible torpedo boats more than they are submarines. But still, steam power was not a good idea. But here is the RN's burn. And again, I mean no, no recriminations against the crews of either HMS York or HMS Exeter. They tried their best. They did very good. But frankly, oh my lord, why? Okay. The cut price Leanders that were the Arafusers. They have a purpose. They have a role. They are actually quite good for the Royal Navy in those duties. And when you see them fulfilling that role, which they get useful for a lot of World War II, you can see their value and their utility. Yes, the ARA La Argentina does kind of stick one in the mm, of the Royal Navy because it does show that they could have built them with triple turrets and then have had as much firepower as A, a Crown Colony, and B, more than a, more than a Leander on that hull. And then you imagine the sheer capabilities that would have brought... But, but, the advantage of going with the twin turrets means your ammunition supplies last longer and you have more space for other things to be carried. So you can't operate further from home. You have more space within the volume that is your hull. However, the counties are not exactly the world's biggest and broadest 8-inch gun cruisers. They are fairly decent, but they are not that particularly massive. Someone had the bright idea that just by taking a turret off, one, uh, one turret off, you could design them more cheaply and more effectively. Really, you'd like to find the person who that idea, had that idea and tie them down on a railway. Not with the trains coming, just with the noise of the trains constantly in the distance and constantly running along the rails nearby. I wouldn't want them run over. I'd just want them tormented by trains for a few hours. I know. I'm, I know. It's evil. But seriously, they sent people to war in these things. Let's think about that. 
They basically said, right then, we're going to make you an 8-inch cruiser. Oh, cute. In a period where no one's able to really build capital ships, so 8-inch gun cruisers are the big things. And by the way, we've just decided that there's a new there's a new tonnage limit, a new tr definition of anything that's got 8-inch guns is a heavy cruiser. Cute. And we're going to we're going to make you with 6 8-inch guns. Now, here is the thing. If you want to build a cut price county, if you really want to, what you do is you take the nail rod design of all the guns forward and you do that in a cruiser. You know why I say that? Because then you have given that cruiser a bit of a chance. You have already got a design for an efficient ship to be built on the treaty limitations, the Royal Navy. That is called the Nelrods. You have built it. Build it in cruiser form and call it a day. That will work. But what they said did was going, ah, no, what we'll do is we'll take, I suppose, the Renowns. And the idea is going, you know, well, the Renowns with their 6.15-inch guns work. Yes, the Renowns with their 6.15-inch guns work. As long as there are people in this world going around with 11-inch gun ships, or people in this world wandering around with 12-inch gun ships, or people wandering around in this world with, you know, ships which are very, very much under their firepower. But you wouldn't want to be in a, in a Renown... Versus an enemy with enough firepower. And you seriously wouldn't want to be in a York class. Six 8-inch guns does not give you a firepower capability. If you consider the rate of fire advantage versus a uh, rate of fire advantage a six inch gun sh a cruiser already has, let alone something which has 12 6 inch guns i.e. a town class. The rate of fire of a town class versus a York class is absurd. The sheer amount of shells, high explosive sailing through the air. And it's not as if there's any treaty cruiser which is actually built, which actually has the armour to resist 6-inch shells at the same range, at those ranges that the 8-inch shells will be firing. No. Bonus! King George V class. And this is mainly in here because there are people who write that I am never, I am always complimentary and always have full of love for the Royal Navy. I honestly think you have never heard me talking about the King George V class because they have the most absurd compromises known to mankind going on. Okay? Let's start off with. Okay, we're going to go for a 14-inch gun. This will give us... Uh, we, we can do this, and we can therefore go for a rate of fire. Why? Because we can therefore build a high-tech version, modern version, of... The Normandy class! Let's consider this for a second. Right? The Normandy class is armed, theoretically, with 12 13.4-inch guns. Now, yes, you are positioning two turrets forward. Yes, it was supposed to be 12, 14 inch guns. But let's be honest, you're basically building the counter to the Normandy class. 20 years and the fact the Normandy class weren't actually built too late. The idea is the sheer volume of shells put up in the air was going to make a massive difference. There is a small trouble this. You only get 10 because weight limitations. And there's the fact that a quadruple turret is hilariously complicated and everyone has issues with them who tries to build them because one gun in a turret creates X problems. Two guns in a turret create two X problems. Three guns in a turret creates four X problems. Guess how many four guns on a turret create? Yes! 8x problems! 8! So, you have got yourself two turrets on a ship which are going to be a constant nightmare. And your twin turret in B position is not enough firepower to help. 
You have purposely gone down this design route. You have made a ship which is going to have issues. Prince of Wales has them at Denmark Strait. Who's surprised? Not only was there a pause in capital ship construction, so she's, uh, she's actually not as far along in the uh, construction timeline as she should have been, there was also the fact that she has quadruple turrets. You sit there and go, well, uh, you know, what is the trouble here? Do you not have 16-inch gun designs? Oh, you do. You have them on Nelson and Rodney. Do you not have 16? You have triple turrets. At the very least, they could have built an updated version of the Nelrod class. That's, like, they could have gone that route. That would have made a perfect amount of sense. They could have gone the 15-inch gun route and upgraded the Queen Elizabeth, uh, the War Spite and all the other Queen Elizabeths they're upgrading and Renown and Hood and all the other things, uh, vessels, 15-inch guns as they go. They could have gone for nine 15-inch guns. They could have gone for nine 16-inch guns. All are options. But they go with 14-inch guns. Because they are trying to make a statement. Because they want to try and get the rest of the world to follow them down. They're doing this when they've also got the intelligence coming in that think that the Japanese could be building a battleship with 17 and a half inch guns. After the Japanese have announced and have actually left the treaty system. So, let me just explain this. I am fairly certain the design decisions which lead to the King George V class in this form do not make sense for rhyme or reason. And I know this because of the design for the documents I've read over the years of design in that period. I know that the third sea lord, who's theoretically in charge of construction, is actually arguing against their construction at points. At other points, he just accepts it because it's what the first sea lord wants. But it's absurd. Right. So, I did promise that there would be the Kriegsmarine coming up. And there are. Now, this will come out on, I think it's the 13th of May. Yep, Saturday the 13th of May. So, I wanted to say once again thank you to everyone who's been supporting our trip to Australia. Both personally and as a group, it wouldn't be possible without it, without your support. Without the money you've contributed, it just wouldn't be viable. As I said, I think earlier when talking about my Shamus book plug, without your support, it would not be viable. And that sounds terrible to say, but... If I give you an example, I, like most young academics and most most young people in this world, I include pretty much everyone under about the age of 50 in, this, in that category at this point, for upfront expense on things, I have to run things through a credit card. I do. My credit card has, been, has had its balance and its levels raised thanks to the regularity and the fact that it shows up on time of Patreon and YouTube. That's what we're talking about. That's what I'm talking about. So I'm able to afford the credit card bill I'm going to have for this trip, which is going to be <clears throat> considerable. Even with, uh, you know, I, I used because I've had to use the credit card already since I've paid it off for Canada because of the issues with um, paychecks earlier this year and other things over Christmas period. Some of the money come in has actually technically paid that off and then been used the rest of the balance to pay it, uh, to pay it. So sort of some, there's a mixture. There's some left on the credit card. It's all fun. The accounts work out. But... I wouldn't be able to do any of that at all without your support. So thank you. And Kriegsmarine. Well, <laughs> Bismarck. 
Look, it might be the most inefficient battleship design produced by anyone in World War II. It might be, and let's be honest, if you want, if you are thinking I'm just talking about the Allied ones, no, the Littorios. If you want an example, go to look at the Littorios. Nicest way, I'm fairly sure a Littorio could, if it wasn't for the quality control of their ammunition, could take a Bismarck every single day, every single way you can think about it. One on one, they would be happy. Send Bismarck and Turpitz versus all the Littorios? Hmm. There won't be a Bismarck and Turpitz left. Notorious might lose one. They are... It's, it's still a potent capability. It can be a horrendously inefficient design. It's still a potent capability. But it is an incredibly inefficient design. But it works. Hence it can fit in the burn category. But it's not quite the worst one the Germans produce. Not quite. <laughs> Okay, so I have a friend who describes these as the tinfoil wrappers of the German Navy. I tend to call them the most overthought through design known to mankind. And when I say that, I mean someone spent so long thinking about this, they managed to think themselves into a black hole of a deserted corridor with no way out, so let's only produce something which is absolutely atrocious. Calling it a burn class. Well, let's see. Um, in its function as a light cruiser, the layout of guns actually make its job more difficult because if it's scouting, it's going to run into the enemy. And... Into the enemy. Okay. What about in its role as a mine layer? Well, this is where you get into the interesting issues of the Koenigsberg class, because theoretically, as a mine layer, they're great. Theoretically, because, you know, everything is orientated around allowing those mines to get out. Small problem. Just a small problem with the mines getting in and out. While they're operating and moving mines, in fact, while they've got mines stowed, they don't like to fire their aft guns, which are the majority of their primary armament, because if you fire their guns, it causes occasionally the mines to jump around on their rails. And mines jumping around on rails is not good. It occasionally causes them to go bang. And uh, that's, that's, that's issues. Uh... They were described even by the Germans as moderately good seaboats, um, only having the potential to capsize if their internal stores were improperly loaded, and, um, you know, those small issues. Think about that for a ship which is operating underway and is going to be under, da uh, under, fire, uh, under fire at some point. Explosions can move things around. You, if you are so problematic that you can only start to capsize if your stores are improperly loaded, then imagine what's going to happen to you the moment you take any damage. Any damage. And you know what's bad? This is not even the one which I am going to be christening as the burn of the Kriegsmarine. Because, no, there is, there is something worse. The Deutschland class. Yeah. You're probably all expecting the Type 1934 Destroyer. And honestly, I was tempted to put it there, mainly just so I could say, hey, I agree with Rack, but no. Type 193 Destroyer is just absolutely terrible. And it's just terrible in design in every single way. But I'm honestly not sure whether you can argue that's down to the best intentions or that's just down to the German polycratic design, the construction design system. Remember, that's the same design system which meant that the Graf Zeppelin ended up with quite so many guns when she was designed for, I think, eight, and they decided the fitter was 16 because they read it as double mounts because they got confused by the German language. 
Ja. Yeah. But no, the Deutschland class. Okay. So why do you stay burn? Well, it starts off with a simple thing. They are designed to be long range cruiser, deterrent ships. Some people like to call them pocket battleships, but they are heavy cruisers. They are they are heavy cruisers, they are not a pocket battleship, and even calling them a heavy cruiser is something which I have an issue with. Because whilst they do have five and a half inches of armor on those turrets, oh good lord, the actual belt is only 80 mil thick, which is 3.1 inches, and the deck is 45 mil or 1.8 inches thick. Which means your turrets might uh, might survive they're not they're not going to be able to withstand anything really that big but your belt will be peppered these things have 11 inch guns six of them in two triple turrets and again they are fore and aft Again, there are other ships around which have an efficient design structure which you could point to. They have a top speed of 28 knots, so they are not outrunning anything. And when I say they are not running anything, I mean there's Hood, there is Renown, there's Repulse. But, let's be honest, there's also the upgraded War Spite, which... Might be able to not go that fast, but in a heavy sea, which these would often get trapped in if they're going into the North and South Atlantic, yeah, a rebuilt war spite, she can probably catch them. Then you got the King George V. They could catch them, but they they come later, so I can understand them not worrying about them. Uh, there are whole classes of destroyers which can catch them. Which is just not good. These ships are really, really not that great in terms of their top speed. Yes, they have a wonderful long range of 10,000 nautical miles at 20 knots. That is great. That is very good. But what does that exactly allow you to do? Because if you're going surface raiding and you want to kill merchant ships, why do you need an 11 inch gun? What does the 11-inch gun with the very heavy turret at the front give you for killing a, a, a merchant ship? I'm just wondering because, you see, the thing is, if you use the 11-inch gun on a merchant ship, it might well hit it and go out the other side of it and blow up on the far side of it, which is lovely from a pyrotechnical perspective, but not very good from sinking the ship perspective. Unless you're managing to fire at a sufficient angle that you go, the shell goes in and goes down in the hull. So you have to be firing from very close range. Because, well, well, I suppose you could be firing from very long range as well. But there again, if you're going to operate under prize rules, you have to stop the ship. And that means you have to get closer to it. And then you have to board the ship if you want to try and gather intelligence. And then you want to sink it. You don't want to use torpedoes for this thing because they're expensive and you're carrying eight 21 inch torpedoes tubes and you know a few torpedoes for that but that's, that, they're expensive uh you've got 5.9 inch guns and single turrets eight of them okay but what's it 11 inch guns for because here is the other thing having those 11 inch guns automatically means you're now in the category that renown hood and repulse are going to be hunting for you okay if you'd fitted them with just 8-inch guns, then probably the Royal, Navy's, uh, Royal Navy or any Navy's only bother will be to send you after it the large cruisers. The moment you have guns which are bigger than the large cruisers, you guarantee that the biggest, killingest thing they can find is going to be hunting you down. You have basically painted a giant target on the back of your cruiser. And yes, I suppose that's going to serve to draw a maximum amount of forces from the decisive area off to hunting it. But that's not really going to help you much unless you have a large enough navy to make use of it. And when they're building these ships, they do not have Plan Z. They're not planning on having that giant a navy. So you get the argument, okay, well, they're good for the Baltic. Under what circumstances is that good for the Baltic? 
Because if you're saying, okay, this is going to take on, I don't know, the Gangats, etc. Really? It's got three guns firing forward, three guns firing us, so it's going to have to go broadside with them. I'm not sure, not 100% sure, but I'm fairly certain a Gangat class, and I'm double checking before I say this, a Gangat class has 12 12 inch guns. Admittedly, it also has to go broadside on with you to fire all its guns, but. 12 12 inch versus 6 11 inch. Now, you can make the point that you can do 28 knots, whereas the Gangots can do 24.1, but there isn't a lot of space to run in the Baltic. What purpose is this for? What is it for? If you're designing as a commerce surface raiding vessel and a global presence vessel, you don't need the 11 inch guns to be that. Everyone else is building 8 inch cruisers at this point. They're the status vessel being built. Just stick 8 inch guns on it. And probably for that weight, you can get 9. Because here is the other thing about the Deutschland class they are heavy. They're 10,800 tons in standard. They are heavy. What? What are you getting out of this design? That you couldn't get out of an 8-inch cruiser designed to fulfill the same role. The thing is, 8-inch cruiser with three triple turrets could actually probably be a narrower beam. You've got a beam of 20.69 meters. You're fat! You're 186 meters long. That's your saving grace. But at nearly 21 meters, you... At nearly 21 meters, you are a cruiser. Okay? You need to be either even longer to justify the length, in which case you are stepping up into the probably, and again, it's, it's, it's always when people call them the pocket battleship, sit there and go, no. You'd be, maybe you could talk, call them a pocket battle cruiser, two words, but probably you're more likely just going to call it a heavy cruiser, because that's what she is. There are all sorts of options of what you could do with this ship. But justifying the 11 inch guns just because they're replacing pre dreadnoughts does not help them. Because that means you're even more confused about what they're supposed to do. Are they surface raiders? Are they global present ships? Or are they Baltic pre dreadnought replacements? In which case, they should never have been out. Because here is the final nail in their coffin. One of these ships gets beaten up by two Leanders, HMS Exeter, a York class cruiser. Okay, yes, York and Exeter are so dissimilar that they can you can actually argue them separate, but a six eight inch gun cruiser aided by two eight six inch gun light cruisers. Beats you up enough that you are forced to go into harbour and scuttle your ship. What's the point in having those 11 inch guns? What are they helping you with? Other than making you a target. Anyway, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Take care. I will finish by, well, saying, what's your version of burn? Remember the definitions. It has to be a ship which was designed, good intentions for roll, but the actual, the very features they fit, fit it in to try and design it to be able to make it do the roll have to actually mitigate it as actually being able to do the roll. So that's the criteria. Thank you very much for watching and hope you enjoyed. Take care.